Welcome back to the Rebellious Media Conference in London. I'm talking to Sakura Saunders, who describes herself as a media and mining activist. Let's start with the media, Sakura. Um, tell me about the Prometheus Radio Project. All right, well, I've been working with a Prometheus Radio Project for almost a decade now. Um, and what we do is we build and advocate for low-power radio. Um, just a little history of Prometheus. We're actually born out of the pirate radio movement in the States. Um, during a time of, of somewhat legal ambiguity, hundreds of radio stations popped up all over the U.S. And it's because at the time, um, it was being pirate radio was being constitutionally challenged as a free speech right. Um, so once that lawsuit uh, was lost based on the technicality, the FCC started shutting down um, radio stations in mass, you know, a few, almost a few hundred in one year. So Prometheus formed during this time that the micro radio movement was at its height to demand that the United States government start um, legalizing low power radio, radio of 100 watts or less. Because at the time you could only get a thousand watt radio station. Okay, so how far does that go, 100 watts? Um, 100 watts, it depends on, you know, if there's um, terrain issues in terms of hills and, and um, you know, issues in terms of competing with other airwaves, but it can reach a good, you know, 10 miles in every direction pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is hyper-local uh, radio, uh, effectively, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but not that local actually, I mean 10 miles in every direction is, is, is really quite... Well that's actually a good case, so sometimes yeah. you know it can reach only one mile if it's in like the middle of New York City or something. Sure, um, so uh, what are the success stories in that? Oh. Um, well, there's amazing success stories, actually, because uh, the state of radio in the U.S. was so horrid in terms of localism. You know, at the same time that they were shutting down all these pirate radio stations, Cheer Clear Channel was coming up as this behemoth in the radio industry, owning something like 1,400 radio stations, and, and localism wasn't anywhere on the airwaves. And so um, we've built... I think about 10 or 11 radio stations um, in the United States and have helped um, hundreds more get on the air. Uh, and these radio stations consistently are volunteer driven, um, you know, focused largely on, on local news, uh, but also network with each other and other, you know, progressive radio stations um, to provide other sorts of alternative news that you don't get anywhere else. Um, you know, they engage many volunteers. When I was, I got my start in college radio. Um, and I love the fact that we had about a hundred volunteer programmers and even more volunteers. Um, and so radio is very unique in the sense that you know, it enables so many different people in the community um, to um, meaningfully engage in this sure. project, you know, to create a reflection of their community. And it, it becomes a microcosm where a lot of people can get together. Um, artists, with the activists, with you know people that are on the local school board or you know, physicians. What's the importance of being an FM station rather than um, just a, a, a broadband station? Well, I mean, of course, the digital divide is is a reality, especially in the United States. Um, so even though it seems, you know, in, in in our little privileged bubbles, sometimes that everyone um, has access to one their own computer mm. um, and then also a steady internet signal that's not dial up you know, that just isn't the case. And so, for example, there's been a number of radio stations um, that Prometheus has built for communities that are um, impacted by this digital divide. So, uh, for example, we built one radio station for a farm workers group in Immokalee, Florida, the Immokalee Farm Workers. And they're very famous uh, for waging their campaigns against Taco Bell, um, McDonald's, um, other, like Burger King, you know, other fast food chains that use the tomatoes that they pick. And their demand was one penny more per pound. Right. Um, which seems like a very reasonable and low demand, but it actually, um, on the fields, translated to a much higher wage for these workers. Um, and so before they had the radio station, you know, they had to knock on each other's trailer doors, you know, um, and call people and do things like that to get people at the meetings, which is extremely inefficient. Um, and, you know, they were lucky if they'd have 30 people show up in a meeting, which, mm -hmm. is, which is actually great. Uh, but once they had the radio station, they had many, many more people come up at all the organizing meetings. And instead of spending so much time doing that outreach, um, 
they were able to put that time into building a media center. And so now actually they do have a media center that does offer um, internet communications and other things you know, to their group of farm workers. That's amazing. So they're, they're very positive examples of citizen media um, with, with, with radio. Um, and and uh, now you're a mining activist as mm -hmm. well. Um, is there a connection between the media and the mining? You, you be, you're, you're working, for instance, on the Tar Sands project, I mm -hmm. think. So, so there's the Tar Sands campaign. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what, what is, um, is there any connection between the two? Well, I think that there is. You know, I, I kind of entered into mining justice activism. Um, actually, part of it was from a radio conference um, where I happened to meet a union leader from Papua New Guinea that was impacted by a, a bare gold mine. And yeah. he told me these stories that were phenomenal. And he was from Papua New Guinea, and so I had to keep in touch with him. Um, so I started a low-level solidarity campaign. And that involved media, but it didn't at first involve radio at all. Um, but, you know, as I started getting more entrenched in media activism, you know, not only doing my campaign against Barrick, but also, you know, um, making myself available, you know, for helping tar uh, campaigns against the tar sands, campaigns against other gold mining companies or uranium or coal, um, I realized that radio is actually the ideal um, communications medium for these communities. Um, over 50% of gold mining is taken from indigenous lands. I've heard everywhere from 70 to 80 percent of uranium mining is on indigenous lands. And of course, you know, we all know from the tar sands campaign that's been wonderfully launched by groups like the Indigenous Environmental Network that indigenous communities are in, um, disproportionately impacted by the tar sands. Sure. Uh, these communities are almost always rural as well. And as such, they're ideal communities because Radio is the most accessible and cheapest form of mass communication. Sure. You know, it's cheaper to set up and reach a wide number of people than mm. even print. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, and these are also communities that don't mm. necessarily have access to their own com personal computers and an internet signal. Uh, but they do love radio. And so I've gone into communities in Indonesia, I've gone into communities in Guatemala, and I've been, been in a couple commu different communities um, in Canada that are tar sands impacted um, to build radio stations for those communities so that they can use it to communicate with each other, to entertain each other. Um, you know, in lots of reservations, for example, um, there's just a lot of boredom. You know, they, sure. you know there's, a, there's a problem with youth flight from these communities. And, you know, these communities um, have a lot of issues with poverty. And so sometimes tar sands are the only jobs they can get. Mm -hmm. And so they're put in this horrible position where, where they need to choose between not having an income and not having a job, or working for these companies that are making it impossible for them to um, carry on with their traditional livelihoods, like you know, hunting and things like that. And without the citizen media, they're 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 um, entirely reliant on the corporate media. Reliant on the corporate media, or you know, just not you know using media that much, yeah. you know, and so. I remember the radio station we built in Fort Chippewan, which is downstream from the tar sands. You know, it was only a community of 1,300 people. Um, you can only access it through um, plain during the summer and land bridge during the winter, you know, when the rivers freeze over. Um, and so it was, the only, it was the only radio station that was broadcasting, that was originating the broadcast locally. Um, and one of the only two that they could get on the radio dial, period. And so we were just engaging people in this way where we were saying text to request. I spray painted FCBC 100.7 on uh, my friend Mike Mercury, who housed the radio station, his car. And we drove around town blasting the radio station, telling everybody about it. It didn't take long till we were getting a text message for a request, you know, every 20 minutes till the council people were coming by and, and bringing down their music. And we very much interspersed it with politics, but it wasn't you know, a solely political station. Just the fact that they were doing this work of entertaining themselves and, and, and doing this project collectively was, was like inherently political. And, and they just, you know, everyone knows about the tar sands. Uh, they don't want to talk, people don't talk about the tar sands that much in Fort Chippewa. You know, they do, but it just um, gets exhausting and emotionally mm -hmm. exhausting, you know, when you, you've seen you know, already over 40 people in a, in a small community died to cancer, many of them very young. Those are very inspiring stories, Sakura, and mm -hmm.
please come back to Plug and Play Channel at the Rebellious Media Conference. This is Vision on TV. Thank you very much. <laughs>